Hi, Heather. Hello, Sharna. How are you doing? I am doing well. I'm actually in the mountains driving, trying to get to the partnership so I can start letting people in. And um, I will be sedentary probably in another five or 10 minutes, but I am on my phone able to, you know, um, to do a little bit, okay? Okay, well, I'm already sharing my screen, so we should be good to go. All right, I will start letting people in then, okay? Okay. And I have a couple places in the presentation to check in with the chat um, so okay. that I'm able to stop and check in with it. So I think we should be fine. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I was up here doing site visits for two days. So, um, yeah, so we just we just did three centers and just trying to get through the little traffic here in Asheville. And I Hades, just then use the left lane to take the ramp to West Gate. I'm just taking it back to Asheville has all this traffic use now. The left lane to take the Asheville ramp to is I terrible. East. I it hate driving what, through there. <laughs> that is what I am finding. And I'm thinking it's supposed to be a nice, relaxed, laid back town. And no, it's not. No, it's Ever not been? at all. It hasn't all been right, that way well, for about 20 years. <laughs> Wow. All right. Well, I am going to start letting people in. Let's see. All right. I see people coming. Use the left lane to take the ramp to I-240 East. In half a mile, use the right lane to take exit 4B for pass. Hi, everyone. This is Sharonda, and I am in transit right now. I'm do, I was doing site visits up in Asheville, so I will be in the office very shortly. However, uh, Heather is here with us to give us some great information. Everybody's very excited about this um, webinar today, uh, Heather. So just so you know, and we've been promoting it with all the centers that I've been going to for the past two days. So we're very excited and I will turn everything over to you. All right, um, we'll give just another minute or two for people to come in. Um, if you'll please put in the chat, I see that uh, we've had at least one response. Your name, the city you're joining from, and if you already have a garden or if you're thinking about starting a garden so I can um, I'll do my best to kind of tailor it to what our audience is today. But my thing, oh, dang, I ain't even see who up there. Oh, 
And also, you guys, if you don't mind muting yourselves, we do hear some conversations happening, okay? Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're still getting feedback. So if everybody, I, let me see, I can go in and mute, mute, but if you guys could check and make sure you're muted, um, you're welcome to unmute if you want to make a comment or not. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Now I'm, uh... Okay. So today we're going to talk about working in the garden with special needs children. And I'm Heather Cleeton. I'm the therapeutic horticulture agent in New Hanover County, and I fall under consumer horticulture. So we have still got some feedback. Let me come in here. Where are we getting that? Um, Latoya, I'm sorry to call you out, but could you go ahead and mute yourself? I cannot mute you from my um screen. So we don't get feedback. Thank you. All right. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about very briefly about the benefits of gardening for uh, early education, early childhood education, because I'm going to assume most of you guys are already proponents of that. We're gonna talk about some accessible garden options. And I see that a lot of you guys are already gardening. Um, please feel free to share in the chat if you have um, some resources that you use that I don't mention, because I always am a very big proponent of learning from each other as we go. I'm gonna talk a little bit about accessible tools. I talk about some precautions to be aware of in the garden. And then um, really what my expertise is, is in fostering engagement in the garden. So I'm gonna refer you a lot to cooperative extension offices. There's where you have your growing experts. So I am not a growing expert. I'm a more, um, have a lot of knowledge in how to engage people in gardens. Um, when I have questions about gardens, I go to our cooperative extension office and ask people that have a lot more knowledge than I do. So we're gonna have specific points to check in with the chat in the presentation. So if you can put questions and comments in there and then we'll go over those as a group. If you have super, something super pressing you wanna stop, you can feel, please feel free to um, unmute yourself. 
And I'm going to check in the chat one more time before we get fully going. And it looks like a lot of you guys have gardens already. So that's awesome. Okay. All right, so just a little bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm not a horticultural specialist. I actually have my um, undergraduate degree in English and I'm currently finishing a master's in social work. So I'm much more focused on the people part of gardens and getting people to engage with what's around them and what they see in a garden. I've had 20 years experience working in therapeutic horticulture. I focus on engagement, growing connections, and this, just in my personal life, I enjoy um, my backyard chickens, growing herbs, I collage, I sew, I do journaling, and I grow a lot of house plants. So that's just a little bit about what um, inspires me to continue doing my work. So one of the things I love most about what I do is that gardens can be active. So you can walk through the garden, you can work hard in the beds, you can do tabletop gardening, some of my students, um, the, when they have come outside and they have a lot of energy, they'll do sprints before we go work in the garden. But then you can also be very passive in the garden. You can sit and look at the garden. You can watch other people work. You can do centering exercises, even with very young children in the garden. Or if it's a very hot day or it's raining, you can look out the window and watch the garden. So there's all kinds of ways that we can engage the garden. It doesn't have to be actually planting plants and going out and picking our vegetables. Working with plants and enjoying nature focus on five primary aspects of wellness, which are social, emotional, cognitive, mental, and physical. I work with a lot of different groups and all of the different groups have different goals that they're working on. Some of them um, will focus on more than one aspect of this wellness. Some of them may only focus on one aspect, but the great thing is that we can design our programs and our curriculum to fit that. <clears throat> this is going to be one of the most important things that I take that I share with you today. This is especially true when we're talking about special needs children. We are focused on the process and not the product. So it's great to get some beautiful vegetables or good smelling herbs out of your garden. But actually participating in the garden and being uh, able to be a part of that is what we're looking for. The engagement is what we want. I, I think with everybody, but most importantly, when we have special needs children. And one of the stories I like to tell the most to illustrate this is that I was working with some very, um, with a participant who was very, very low functioning. Um, she only had use of one hand. And even with that one hand, um, her movements and everything were very sporadic. And they would always tell me how much she enjoyed coming to groups at the Arboretum. And I would ask, I finally asked them how they knew she was enjoying it because she was also nonverbal. And they said, well, when she's here, she keeps her head up the whole group. And, you know, she's, she's much more active than she usually is. And one day she was very, very active. And she got, um, we were planting up pineapple uh, sage, which has a very beautiful fragrance. And she grabbed a plant and she was, pounding it on the table and her teachers went over to stop her and I said no no let her let her please let her pound that plant and we'll give her another one if she needs it because it wasn't about her potting the plant up it was about her being engaged and whether whatever sensory um she was getting from that plant she was clearly enjoying it and so she probably pounded about three plants into the table that day but she really enjoyed her experience and um, it was the most active she ever was in a group with us. And so that's a great illustration of we weren't there to grow plants. We were there to be engaged with each other and with the plants we were growing. Gardens can benefit all children. It's just we need to find the right path for engagement. And this is especially true for our children that have special needs. We need to find the right way to get them to engage. Um, a lot of children who have uh, autism or some type of sensory disorder, they may not wanna touch dirt. And so we need to, as someone who's working with them, find a way to make them comfortable with, with what they're doing. And for me, a lot of times that is um, just letting them sit and observe their peers. 
I, um, most of the time, a child will not get all the way through an activity just observing. They'll start off saying, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to touch the dirt. Uh, and then by the end of it, they say, well, I want to try. Can I try? And so you give them the space to find their own time to get there. The same is true. Um, I also take in chickens, um, snakes, and other reptiles into classrooms and schools. And oftentimes the child that is the most resistant to participating at first is the one that doesn't want me to leave at the end of the day. So, but I always give them the space. I always tell them that it's optional for them to participate, but they can sit quietly and watch. All right, I'm gonna do a quick check-in. We had a few more responses in our chat. Um, does anybody have anything, any questions, comments about anything so far? Okay, we'll keep going. All right. So when you're planning your garden, my best advice to people is to keep it simple. I like, uh, I am I promote a lot with my school gardens that they grow in recycled containers. They use large landscape pots. Um, you can get these very cheap, if not free, um, by going to home improvement stores and landscape companies. So tree pots are really, really good for growing tomatoes and peppers, even squashes. They're large. Um, and then you can make your, your garden adaptable so you can move it around to how you want it. It's, it's very, um, you know, everybody when they start off, they want a picture perfect garden. But those of us who garden a lot know that that doesn't always happen. And you put in these really great raised garden beds and then maybe a year or two later, you realize, well, this wasn't the best place to put them, or we need to expand our playground, and now we've got to move them. So growing in containers is a really great way to ensure that your uh, garden is going to be adaptable in the future. But here are some very simple raised bed examples. Uh, the raised bed that is on the ground, I actually built myself. Um, so it's super easy to build. It's just a four by four bed. Um, the other two are raised a little bit to be more accessible to someone in a wheelchair or someone who doesn't want to bend down. And so um, the, you can see that these are at two different heights to accommodate different heights of children. Um, and also we have so many different types of wheelchairs now that um, you, you kind of really need to evaluate the needs of your particular students for what type of bed might work for them. Um, these beds, you'll see they're very close to a sidewalk, so they're super easy to, to get to. Another great way is to grow, just grow straight in a soil bag. So you don't have to make a lot of cost inputs into starting a garden. You can start a garden in all different types of ways. The really nice thing about growing in soil bags is that you can, again, put them on a table so that they would be high enough for say a child in a wheelchair. Here is a slide that talks about container sizes. And this is from um, another presentation that was very focused on growing vegetables in containers. I'm gonna leave it up for just a second in case anyone wants to take a picture of this, but I know that this presentation will also be posted online so you guys can come back to it. You can also make beds out of recycled material. So I like to make, a, I call it a modified Hugel Kutcher. Hugel Kutcher is a German method where you create a raised beds bed with wood and organic materials and soil. Um, it's cheap and too free because you're using recycled materials. So you're keeping all of that wood material from going into the landfill or having to be burned. Um, these beds help you conserve water, and it also, as the wood breaks down, improves your soil. Um, so you do have to, with these beds, add soil as the wood begins to break down over the years. But this is a really great way to build a raised bed without a lot of expense. The 4x4 the four four raised bed that I showed you guys was probably about $150 in material, and that's not counting the soil that you would need for it. Um, a larger bed, say a four by six raised bed um, that we build, these cost us $500 to build. 
You can also uh, do vegetables in straw bale beds. And um, you can see that this makes a really nice uh, bed. And again, you have them at a good height to work in. And relatively inexpensive. I think these bales of straw, anywhere from, you know, five to eight dollars a bale. You can also do bucket garden beds and you can find um, easily find plans for these bucket garden stands online. And then, of course, people are selling kits as well. And then you can just build, put a garden in a lasagna pan. Um, he can recycle these, but if you do want to buy them new, they're relatively cheap. And we use these a lot in our program. And then you can move the garden wherever you need to. These are um, accessible growing benches, benches. So these are built at wheelchair height. Uh, we are super lucky at our site because we have a group of carpenters and they build these for us. These would also be great for an Eagle Scout project. You can see that ours have casters on the bottom. That's not necessary, but it does make it nice for um, me to be able to move them around. And I can put any type of container that I'm growing vegetables in on top of these tables, very easy to water. Because they have the mesh for the top, the uh, screen mesh, they're relatively lightweight. And so this is a great way to build out an accessible gardening space uh, without a lot of expense. Another thing that I get asked about a lot is accessible tools. And I would say, uh, well, one, it's gotten so much easier with um, the internet to find accessible tools. Uh, this is a great kit because you can uh, put the different tools into the base, um, but do some research. Also uh, assess the needs for your children. Um, and I really recommend starting with one set to make sure that you're gonna use it and then buy more if you find that they're working well and you do use them because you don't wanna make a big investment and then you find out nobody uses the tools. Um, in our garden, we actually do a lot with just everyday silverware. So we use big tablespoons as shovels. It's really great um, for the this preschool age children. And then uh, forks are actually really good for getting out little weeds. Um, we start, have started using those in our school gardens because they're cheap. So I don't, and they're they're not bulky, so they're easy to transport. And the kids can get down with the fork and get under the weed and pop it right out of the soil. Um, I did want to put an example here of someone using an extendable hoe to work in a garden bed, so you can see how these tools might help somebody. And I'm gonna do another check-in on our chat. So if anybody has a question and they want to unmute while I'm checking, please yeah. do. Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yep, can I can. You, I, I can't see you because I don't know what happened. I've been trying, I got on when you first start, then I heard you, then it says your microphone is unmuted. Your video is, why is the video stopped? But I can hear you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, is anybody else having problems with their video? Yeah, um, I, I'm trying to get so I can check. So I need to check and let you know I'm, I'm in the meeting, right? My name and everything so I can get a certificate, right? Yes, um, ma'am. You can do that yeah. for if you can do that for me. I appreciate it. Yes. And okay. we can see you and I can see that you're unmuted, Dorothy. This is Sharonda. Hey, uh, but you're hey, but you're good to go. You're good to go. OK. OK, honey. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Dorothy, nobody else is having everybody else is able to see the video. So I'm not okay. sure. Not sure either. I don't know. It's like. I see. I, mean, I see to the uh, Tamisha Lewis on there. But I see. So I see the chat, but I just don't I don't see like I should be able to see you. Right. No, you should be able to see the you, you might see me in the corner. You should be able to see the presentation that I have. Um. Oh. My, my the only thing I could suggest is that you go, um, there's different icons where you can show different screens and maybe you just have it on a certain screen. Oh, I got it. I got okay. it. Okay. I'm so, right. I'm so 
So I'm still learning. I had my computer set up, and then it told me I needed to download you guys. And now I'm sitting over there downloading something. I don't even know what it's downloading. So I got my phone. It's just been it's just been a, a wonderful day. Thank you for your patience with me. No and, um, problem, Dorothy. All right. Um, we're going to head on through to the next slide. And so planning your garden. Um, always assess your needs. You need sun for your plants. I find super, super important, almost as important as the sun for the plants is the shade for your gardeners. Um, we use movable patio umbrellas so that we can move the, sun, the shade around as we need it. But particularly in the months of June, July, and August, it gets so hot so quickly that if you don't have some shade, you're not going to be out in your garden, um, unless it's very early in the morning. But these days, I walk out at 8 o'clock and it's too hot for me to be outside. The most important thing that I look for when I'm assessing a site for a garden is water access. Again, um, you know, water is super important with the heat that we have. And yeah, you know, people will say, well, we'll water with cans. Well, you're going to water with cans for about two days, and then you're going to get very, very tired of that. So water access is probably the most important thing to make sure you have. And make sure that it's not just access, but it's going to be somewhat convenient. Um, I do think hand watering is a great exercise for students, and the students really enjoy doing that when um, we do that as part of our group activity. But it needs to be, you know, you need to be able to get the hose out. You need to be able to get the hose put away easily. All of those things. And then depending on what you, what, who you're serving, you want to look at the accessibility of your beds or containers. It's super easy. And I think I have another shot, slide that I mentioned this, but it's very easy to put some beds beside a sidewalk. If you do ha have a student who is using a wheelchair has a walker, walker or maybe even has some trouble walking, then you can put a bed for them at the sidewalk and then have some other beds throughout um, different places of your garden. So you don't have to make all of your garden accessible if you don't have that resource to be able to accommodate. And so that's something else that I really like to try to remind people is you don't have to pave your whole garden. You don't have to make sure you can get a wheelchair through the whole garden or that a wheelchair can go up to each bed. In an ideal world, that's that's great, but you can include people by just doing a few things um, and giving them some space to work at. Again, as I said, use your county extension office as a resource, um, and there are county extension offices in every county. It's just a matter of finding those. I know we have a few extension people on here as well, so that's awesome. Um, they can help you out with all kinds of different things, uh, not beyond just plants. Also, you know, how, how to bring nutrition education into the garden with the vegetables that you're growing. And they may even have resources for how could you get some garden beds built. Um, so we have Eagle Scouts that want to work with us all the time. So a lot of times your extension might be able to connect you to some of those Eagle Scouts. So please remember that extension office is a really valuable resource. Um, as you're choosing your plants, make sure that you're going to choose plants that are appropriate to the season. Again, Extension has a lot of resources out there um, about growing. You also might want to experiment some. So in our area, and I'm in Wilmington, so I'm on the coast, we're very hot. We're typically, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees warmer than other parts of the state. Um, so there's a lot of uh, what they call early spring plants that I actually grow in the fall and winter here uh, and they do much better for me in the fall and winter but I had to get to know my season to be able to do that um figure out what the purpose of your garden is I know that some of you guys are actually growing out for production you want to have snacks for the students and so you're going to grow a little differently than someone who might be trying to grow a sensory garden and sensory plants are great. Even if you are growing uh, for production, I encourage you to have some of those sensory plants around. Uh, herbs, We uh, one of my favorite herbs that is not hard, uh, cold hardy, but does really well in the heat is called Cuban oregano. And it's actually a succulent plant and it's very fragrant. But things like lemon balm, uh, lavender. Um, and you wanna pick, especially for your preschool gardens, plants that are easy to grow in your area. So you know, 
unless you as a staff person um, are going to spend a lot of time growing heirloom tomatoes might not be your best choice. But growing uh, t uh, cherry and pear tomatoes that do really well uh, would be a much better choice. And I actually um, really enjoy growing something called a husk cherry, which is actually like a tomatillo. And they come in, it's a it's a cherry, it looks like a cherry tomato, except it has a little husk around it and they taste very much like grapes and they do really, really well in the heat. So that would be a great thing to grow. Um, of course, the kids love to pull the radishes and the carrots. For us, where we are, we can only grow those in the very early spring or grow them in the fall and winter because of our heat. Um, so, so spend a little time doing some research. Talk with other gardeners in your area. Um, you know, as I said, we are great resources for each other. Um, learn, learn from other people what plants they've had success with. Again, this is this is one of my other big takeaways. Be flexible. Um, you can put your raised beds by your existing sidewalk. I put a couple of examples um, that I just pulled off of Amazon. Um, the grow bags, you can get five for $20. This city picker bed is $40 on Amazon. And you can put them anywhere. And they're very easy to move when you need to. So there's a lot of great options coming out. Um, COVID, one of the good things that did come out of it was a lot of people got interested in gardening again. And so a lot of new gardening products have been coming out over the last couple of years. And they're, uh, they actually make gardening a lot easier. And especially uh, people are really targeting gardening in small spaces. So, you know, patios and things like that. And they, all of those things translate really well into a preschool environment. Other uh, reasons that you want to keep your space adaptable, the sun moves, right? So our sun moves daily. So I, what I like to do is have a place that I can garden in in the shade uh, throughout the day. And that can be hard, but if you, if you plant it right and you have some trees, you want to make sure that your plants are getting at least six hours of sunlight a day, but you can adjust so that you have some shade to work in. The sun also moves seasonally. So what might be a great growing place one part of the season. So for example, I really like to have some shade on some on my plants in the summer, but in the winter, I want those plants to be in full sun. And then of course, as I mentioned before, the needs of your facility might change. Um, you may not have any kids that have physical disabilities right now, but you may end up with some kids that have physical disabilities in the future and you need to make some adjustments or you need to expand your playground um, all kinds of things might happen. So um, we have a very defined space in our arboretum that is where we garden. And um, it's actually come to be kind of restrictive. And so when we do get a chance to remodel, I, I want to make sure that our space is a little bit more adaptable um, in the future. And it's our space is very, very accessible, right? So accessibility is one thing, being able to get into it. Adaptability is another, being able to change it up as you need. So there are safety concerns in the, um, in the garden. I know that one I left out of here is sun. You wanna make sure if you are in the sun that you've got um, sun protection. Bees, and I have, we're gonna talk more about bees um, on the next slide, but definitely you wanna make sure your facility has an EpiPen. Um, even if, if parents put on the form that their children don't have allergies, that can change and you never know when that's going to happen. So um, it's, you definitely want something like that to be at your facility. You also want to do education around bees and other things that sting and, we're, and other animals that might be in the garden, which we'll talk about on our next slide. Tools, you want to make sure that um, you're using tools that are appropriate to the age and the population. So a lot of the work I do is with students with behavioral issues and um, they, they tend sometimes to fight with each other. So we make sure that we don't have any scissors uh, during our group or if they were using scissors, they stay on the person of an adult the whole time. I try if we are using uh, garden trowels to make sure they're not sharp. Um, once we get to know the kids a little bit better, we will allow them to use uh, some, some tools with parameters. And then if they can't follow the directions, then the tools are taken away with it from them. 
But like I said, I do a lot with very large tablespoons and forks in the garden because those are things that the kids are used to using at home and they work really well. Then you also want to be careful of plant allergies. Um, you know, I know that people um, will put down allergies, but certain scents um, and herbs, especially like uh, plants that have citronella oil in them, may not um, may bother some children. So you just want to make sure that um, that you're you're being sensitive to that and that you're being aware that there could be allergies. So st this is definitely not to discourage anyone from trying out plants, but just knowing that those allergies are out there. Um, like for me, lavender is a really nice scent, but I had a student tell me that he really hated lavender because um, he was always getting sent to this one person's office and they always used lavender lotion. So he associated his time that wasn't good in this person's office with that smell. So just be aware of things like that as you're working through the, the garden. And that's not a true allergy. That was just something that he didn't enjoy, but, um, Okay, bees and other things that sting. This is a big um, concern that I have because I've worked with many, many schools that will tell me that they want flowers by the front door and they want flowers over here. And then we plant the flowers and the bees come and they wanna spray for bees. So if you are going to garden, you are gonna need bees. Bees pollinate our plants and they give us our flowers and our food. Most bees and wasps will not sting unless startled or attacked. It, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a sting happen that was just completely random. Usually you bumped up against the bee, stepped on it, um, have disturbed, if it's a wasp, disturbed its nest. Um, so bees aren't really looking to sting us. And there are quite a few bees that actually don't even have stingers. Um, so the carpenter bees and things that have a very big buzz, but they actually don't have a stinger. So what I share with my kids when I'm working with them is to remain calm. If there's an insect flying around you, the worst thing you can do is to start jumping around and trying to spot it because then you're likely to agitate it and it will sting you. I like to tell them that the bee thinks that they might be a flower. And once it has smelled you a little bit and sees that you're not a flower, it's going to fly away. So this is something um, that can be very difficult to address. Uh, you know, a few months ago, well, a few weeks ago in our garden, we had a lot of um, ground digging wasps that were mating. And so they were all over the place. Most of them were males and did not have stingers. So we had to put up a lot of informational signs in our garden about what they were and how to interact in the space where the wasps were. Um, we really do need to learn to be comfortable with bees again and live with them because they are important to our food system. And so uh, starting when kids are really young uh, is a good way to do that. And yes, there is always a small risk of getting stung, but um, we need to take that in as this is a risk that we live with and that there's things that we will do if we do get stung. All right, so I'm gonna move into some activities and tasks that I like to do when I'm in the garden. I love um, to just go in the garden and prompt the kids to do some observation and let them tell me what they're seeing in the garden. Um, you get some really interesting comments. You get to see what they um, are fascinated by, and then you can build out some curriculum around that. So a lot of times I might get questions from students that I didn't plan on answering that day, and maybe I know the answer, or maybe I tell them I'll come back with some more information for them. Weeding. Um, I really make sure that the gardens that I work in are the gardens for students. They're not my garden, but they are the student's garden. And so the students participate in every single aspect of the garden from weeding and getting the beds ready to plant, to planting, to then watering, which is a huge one. Um, and then going back and weeding, you know, we check like every week for weeds. And yes, that is a tedious and boring task, but that is part of gardening. And so we want them to learn that part uh, they usually love the watering 
We use that as a great way to take turns and use some self-control. Um, I also will um, always include the kids if we have to pick up trash or other debris in our garden. Again, this maintenance, um, you know, I want them to understand that a garden is fun, but it also is work and there are tasks that need to happen and so that they can be a part of all of that. And mulching, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about mulching in just a minute, but um, we incorporate the students in all of these activities. Know your gardeners. So I like to have, um, I usually am working in 30 minute chunks with uh, my, my gardeners, my young gardeners, and I'll have at least two 15 minute activities planned. If I know that it's a group that has a really short attention span, I might have three uh, 10 minute activities, but very often my kids will really get into one of the activities um, and they are having so much fun and I know that I can stretch that activity out and let them enjoy that for the whole time that we're together. And so I do. I don't stop their enthusiasm because I need to move on to something that I want to do. Um, that's one of the things about my program. I'm focused on um, these social uh, goals, behavioral goals, sometimes physical therapy goals, not academic goals. So I don't have to get a set curriculum done. And so um, I'm going to give you guys a, a great example of this. We were, uh, one of my schools has a native plant garden and we have to weed it a lot. And we were weeding it and it was filled with dollar weed. And the students got into a competition over who could get the longest dollar weed root out. And they were getting roots that were over six feet long. And they were having the best time that we let them spend their whole time uh, for that session, just pulling the dollar weed. And they actually, uh, they started out competing against each other, but then by the time they were done, they were all working on the same team so that they could keep that root as long as possible. And their teacher shared with me after the, their group time was over, that that was the first time, this was towards the beginning of the school year, that that was the first time those students had worked together on anything the whole school year. And she was really having a hard time with that class because they were um, arguing with each other so much and were so competitive with each other. And so we found something that they could work as a team on. And this just happened. They, I didn't, you know, other than facilitating them weeding and then encouraging what I was seeing happen in the garden, this happened completely organically. The kids built themselves into a team. And that's to me what the beauty of gardening with kids can be is that they don't even realize what they're doing because they're so busy doing it. So just, I always just try to be really flexible. Um, if I see the kids are engaged, then I will continue with that activity. Also, if I see that I've got it planned for 15 minutes and in by five minutes they're over it, then we'll move on to the next thing. Okay, here's some other tips. This is just from experience that I've had. Um, if you're gonna leave a bed uh, most dormant or mostly dormant, so you don't have a lot planted in it, cover crop, it helps keep out the weeds, it provides green manure, which adds nutrients to the soil, and it provides um, insect habitat and food. And we need beneficial insects. So this is a great way. What I like about it the most is that it keeps the weeds out. So you're not having to go back in and dig out. The cover crops are easy to turn in to your garden and then you just let them sit for a week or two and then you're ready to plant. So um, things to use for cover crop is like red and white clover. Um, you can use ryegrass. Uh, there's, there's other, um, things in the pea family that you can use uh, and you just spread those out and let them grow. And then you turn it in a couple weeks before you're ready to plant and you have a really nice bed to plant in. Mulch your beds. I said we were gonna get back to this. Again, where I am is very hot. Mulching helps um, retain moisture. I'm sure those of you who grow in raised beds have noticed that raised beds dry out faster than the ground does. And so this is a really nice um, adaptation to use in your raised beds to help keep the moisture in. Again, it helps keep out the weeds so you're not having to do as much weeding. And as the uh, mulch breaks down, you're adding nutrients to the soil. So I like to use just a plain old uh, hay straw. 
uh, for mulching, you could use pine straw, but it's a little bit acidic. Um, but the the straw just works great. Uh, it's very easy to put down. The kids really enjoy putting it down. And then it takes away some of that ongoing maintenance that you have with your garden. All right, check in on the chat. Does anybody have any comments while I check in? I don't see anything in the chat right now. Okay. All right. And if nobody has any comments, we'll keep going. Okay. So here's just now, this is where I'm going to share some fun things that I like to do in the garden. I love growing loofahs. This, all of these pictures are from loofah vines that I grew in our garden at the Arboretum, including uh, the loofahs that are in the middle that are, um, dried okay and peeled um one loofah gourd will produce about 50 seeds so this is a great plant to grow and share and you can see it just gets covered with these beautiful golden flowers it takes the heat um they do have a really long day to set fruit so this plant needs about 120 days in the garden to set fruits um so i plant them in early april and then i'm usually starting to get fruits about mid-september um, so I, like I said, I like to keep a lot of different activities that I can use with, um, my students. I call keeping those in your back pocket because I just have these to bring out and use. Worm bins, they're very easy to keep. Um, the kids love to see the worms. Um, of course they start treating them like their pets. I've even had students start naming them. This is another, um, worm bins are really great for those students that have, uh, sensory issues. So this is one where, you know, there'll be a student who does not, does not want to touch a worm, does not even want to look at worms. And so they're, they're invited to just sit while their peers participate. And by the end of it, you know, I'm having to ask them to put the worms down and put them back in the bin and they've named all the ones that are in their hand. Um, the Echo Tower, this is a Jenga game that uh, is laid out with different um, things from our ecosystem like plants, soil, uh, fresh water, salt water, built environments, mammals, people, and you take out different pieces of the environment and see what happens to your tower. Um, there's different versions of it you can play so you can allow kids to win back blocks if they want to try to repair their environment, or you can just see what happens if you just keep on taking things out. Uh, leaf rubbing is another one of my favorites. Uh, you can collect leaves that day well, you can have the kids collect them, or you can bring in some leaves that you've collected. And it's a really great, you wouldn't think of it as this, but it's very great active activity for kids. So kids who have a lot of energy and they're doing that rubbing, it gets a lot of that energy out, helps work it out for them. Kitchen gardens, you just take your kitchen scraps like celery, uh, carrot tops, onions, and put them on a win windowsill and they grow beautifully. And it only takes them a couple of days to start to regrow. Um, and then microgreens. And I do microgreens in uh, blueberry, like berry clamshells, which makes a nice little greenhouse. They usually sprout, usually within 24 hours, but within like two days, depending on what conditions they have. Um, you can do these and then the kids can even take them home and snip off and have a little bit of that microgreens with their dinner. So they, these are some great activities that are super easy. Um, very little uh, investment in any of these. The worm bin that I have on this page is actually a dish pan from um, a restaurant supply. So it probably cost me about $20 for the um, container. And then, you know, fishing the worms, the red wigglers are about $5 at the store, the bait and tackle store, but there's a good chance you could go to your extension office, ask them to put a call out to their master gardeners, and there's probably somebody that keeps worms around that would be more than happy to donate to you because when your worms are happy, they produce a lot more worms. Watching the clouds. This is one of my favorite things to do, and you can do it very spontaneously. Um, they also have a lot of things out. I put in two different types of cloud viewers. One is kind of more handmade, and then one comes for the, from the Center for Science Education. 
and you actually cut out the center of it and then it has the different types of clouds that you can identify around the edge. So this is a really simple thing to do um, when you need a little, you're out in the garden, you guys have watered, you've weeded, your kids are still have a little bit of energy and need something to focus on. You just pull out your cloud viewers and um, you can do this multiple times because the clouds are always different and you can start even if you want to to chart what kind of clouds you're seeing and are you seeing similar types of clouds in similar types of times of year and etc so all kinds of ways to add into this and then don't forget to look up at the trees so trees can provide us so much um, engagement you, know, you almost can't go up to a tree and not find some ant trails on it or some beetles crawling up and down or some exoskeletons of some beetles that have shed their skin. So don't forget to explore some of the other aspects that might be in the garden. Um, and of course, collecting the leaves for your leaf rubbings. Okay, so my three super big takeaways is that you wanna do process over product. So you really wanna focus on that engagement, not having the most successful garden. Um, I get lots of grants for my gardens and sometimes the, uh, I especially get grants from garden clubs and the ladies will want to come over and look at the gardens. And a couple of times they've made comments about how the garden doesn't look, you know, so great. And I say, well, you know, it's the kids garden and we really let them garden in it and so you know sometimes it looks really good and sometimes it doesn't but um it's that process uh keep your space flexible because your needs will always change and then go with the flow make sure you're following the you give yourself the space to follow the kids lead and that you don't have everything so um planned out that you don't have any flexibility in what you're doing out in the garden and I see we're getting some stuff in the chat so um, I'm going to check the chat while I have these resources up. Um, I really want to promote the THAD, the Therapeutic Horticultural Activities Database. Um, that's through the University of Florida. Uh, it is not geared towards um, preschool kids. It's actually activities that are uh, designed with therapeutic outcomes in mind. But there are really, really great activities on there. And you guys would easily be able to adapt them to your uh early childcare environments. And then kidsgardening.org, I follow their newsletter. They always have great ideas on there. Um, the National Learning Institute is actually through NC State and they have gardening with young children. And I know that there are links from the um, Farm to Early Child Care uh, website too, to that NLI. Um, so, and then of course, don't forget about your Farm to Early Child Care um, in education. They are doing a great job uh, getting a lot of information on their site and pushing things out to you guys. So there's all kinds of things out there that you can um, can work to get to. All right. Heather, so, yeah. Heather, we had the question of what can we do with loofah plants? So with loofah plants, so um, the loofah is actually, it's, a, it's like a squash. It grows on a vine. Um, they are edible. You eat them when they're really young because they're very fibrous. And so um, you can eat them and there's different recipes online that you can find for them. But what I grow them for is I grow them to their, um, their full size. You leave them on the vine until they start to brown. You actually leave them on the vine as long as you can. You don't want them to freeze on the vine. And then um, you, you harvest them. You let them dry fully. So when they're dry fully, the um, outer skin is brown and dry and will actually break. And you can shake it and hear the seeds inside. And then once it gets to that stage, you peel the skin off and you have a loofah sponge. And you can use those for all kinds of stuff. I use them in my kitchen. Um, I use them in the shower. Uh, you can use them at, to do you know painting, sponge painting. I mean, the list goes on and on. They're really great because um, a lot of people think they come, loofah sponges come from the sea, but they don't. They're a plant we can grow and they love the heat. So they're a really good plant to grow in the South. Um, and all right, so that is, that was our only question, but we're pretty much done. I think I just have a closing slide. So if anybody wants to unmute and ask anything, 
please feel free. All right. Yeah. And I'm going to leave the resources slide up for folks. So I'm more than happy to ask questions, uh, answer any questions. Um, I do in my job do some site visits. Um, I am in Wilmington, so I can't promise that I will go anywhere in the state. Um, it all depends on what my schedule is like in my county. If I can travel, um, I also do workshops across the state. Um, I do ask that we have like 12, at least 12 attendees if I'm going to do a workshop. Um, but yeah, so all of those things are options as well. And I just want to piggyback on what Heather just said as far as um, she will be at our institute in October. And so during that time, if you guys were not with us last year, you missed out on a great treat from Heather because it was hands on. And I mean, hands on from the beginning of the moment that you walked into her classroom until you ended. And there was nothing but high admiration for the work that Heather uh, did at our work at our um, institute and the work she does in general for um, this this segment of our population because we are excited to have her we are happy to have her and if you guys come out on October the 5th you will not be disappointed again because she is going to basically continue what she was doing today but it's going to be even richer because you're going to be doing hands-on because that is truly what Heather believes so they, yes. to immerse you in everything is just like she would do her students therefore you can get a true understanding of how to implement the program. So yeah, I just and I'm gonna try as hard as I possibly can to make sure that everything that we do is very hands-on at the institute. Um, but yeah, that that Sharonda definitely nailed it. I'm I am thankful I don't have to try to work academic standards in. I mean, we definitely will do some math in the garden, we'll do some, you know, poetry writing in the garden, but um I get to just focus on fun engagement. Uh, with with the students I work with, and that really makes a huge different difference in their willing willingness to participate. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Sharonda. That was awesome. No, we thank you as always, and um, we just we're happy to have you anytime. At this time, like Heather said, we would like to open up the floor to any questions that you may have. Please unmute yourselves. Uh, put it in the chat and we will answer any questions that you have. And I will also say that if any of you guys are um, considering a garden, but you're having issues around funding, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I, I don't have to do as much fundraising as I used to do, but um, I'm very good at finding funds for projects. So, and, and you know, and can help you figure out ways to look in your community for the money. Um, so. Please make sure that you have put your name. Everybody that may be sitting around the camera with you, please make sure I have all those names and the name of your center in the chat so I can make sure that you do receive certificates for today. Also, our next uh, learning burst will be next week, the 17th, and that will be identifying helpful and harmful garden critters. And that came from a lot of you asking about those different critters in the gardens. And then on July 24th, we're gonna be talking about composting and water in the gardens. And Kyle, We'll be back with us to do those two, okay? So just so you know, those are our next ones, the critters in the garden, and then um, the, wa the water and composting with your children and what you have to do with that, because a lot of people do ask what they can do when it comes to composting at a preschool, okay? Any questions other than that beforehand, as always, please feel free to email me we will have the slides and any information that Heather has to go along with um, that she was talking about today in a wrap up by Friday to go out to you. Anything else? 
Well, as always, Heather, thank you so much. I can't wait to October to see you in person again, put my arms around you and just thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing, especially on at the coast. So, and I'll be driving back that way in a few, in a few minutes. So <laughs> well, that's safe travels. <laughs> yeah, safe travels today. And I will look forward to seeing you in October as well. And anyone who comes. So, um, and to all of you that are gardening, good luck. I hope your gardens do well throughout the summer. That's all right. Good luck, y'all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Dorothy. Thank you, Latasha. I saw both of you. Yep. All right. See, everybody's getting their stuff in for you. I see. That's why I'm not ending yet. Yeah. I think these are great um, sessions. I'm going to pop in for the composting one. I want to see what he has to say about composting. Not a problem. Do you have the sheet that has all of the? I the do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. I'm curious, since no one's left yet, where would we get a loofah plant or seed? Um, a lot of garden centers have the seeds. Uh, I gave them away at the Institute. Um, so if you come to the Institute in October, I'll try to have some, hopefully. Um, but usually, they, and you can definitely order them online. Um, if you go and to is like- is another uh, name for it, or is it just loofah? It's Lufa. It's spelled different. So I, I have it spelled L-O-O-F-A-H. Sometimes you'll see a L-U-F-A-H. Um, yeah. Okay. But I'm pretty sure I saw them not too long ago at our local garden store. I mean, once you get one, oh my God, you have seeds for the rest of your life. But <laughs> so it okay. kills me to go pay somebody $3 for some, you know, a handful of like 10 seeds because I'm like, oh my gosh. But um, yeah, I gave seeds away at the last institute, so I'll definitely bring those again. Mm. So you got to make sure you come, Miss Cassandra. I would certainly love to. <laughs> Anyone else? Miss Annie, I see you talking. It's Adrian. Oh, Adrian. Okay, I'm sorry. It's coming up, Annie, on the screen. Okay. Yeah, it's under her account. I was. It's two of us. Um, okay. me, Adrian Jones, and then the Tiger Stylus. Okay. Did you put that in the in the chat for me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. You are good then. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if that's all good, then I will go ahead and I will end this for everybody, okay? I just wanted to make sure everybody got a chance to put all their information in the chat. We are recording and um, we will see you next week. Bye, everyone.